Hi students, this is Professor Ahern and uh, welcome to uh, Marketing 3336 Principles of Marketing. Uh, we're gonna be covering uh, chapter 10 today titled Pricing, Understanding and Capturing Customer Value. This is the first of two chapters that really get into the topic of pricing and understanding pricing, which is one of the instrumental four Ps. Uh, in fact, we'll talk about this, but uh, this is the only one of the four Ps that actually uh, demonstrates a cost to the uh, consumer. All the others are benefits. So we have to be very careful with how we frame um, uh, pricing. And then also being uh, pricing becomes a real uh, science. And we're going to talk a lot about all the different strategies for pricing and how firms often think about pricing strategies. Today, we'll introduce some of the foundational principles of pricing. And then next chapter, we'll get into some of the more significant strategic mechanisms that firms use for pricing theory. So before we get started, let's watch a short video on Walmart. Uh, Walmart uh, is one of the big players in the marketplace that focuses on this um, making money by pricing below cost. And that is what we call the loss leader pricing strategy, where we bring in people on very low prices for certain products. And as a result of that, they, they come in, they shop, and they get more products uh, and, and buy a, what we call a basket bundle of uh, value uh, at, at, our, uh, at our store. So let's learn a little bit about Walmart and about the strategy that makes them very effective. I'm Alex Berman, and you're watching Selling Breakdowns. Although there are many different industries and services and products, there's one thing that ties all businesses together. You sell your product for more than it costs, right? Well, not always. Today, we're going to look at the idea of loss leaders, where retailers sell some items at a loss in order to attract customers. We'll use Walmart as our main example, but we'll look into a few others as well. Let's start with some recent news. In case you haven't heard, Amazon recently bought Whole Foods and their first act, practically on day one, was to slash prices. It seems strange, doesn't it? Whole Foods is a really strong brand, famous for its high quality produce. Why not just use the existing Amazon distribution structure to help it expand? Well, Amazon knows that the reason they're so dominant online is that they operate at very fine margins and Walmart's not that much different. So if you wanna compete in the grocery business, you have to go cheap. Seriously cheap. Even if you forget about coupons, it's possible to buy a basket of something in Walmart where the store would be making zero profit or even a loss on every single item. The most common are dairy products like milk and eggs. A gallon of milk might sell for four bucks, but it could cost them six dollars from the supplier. Eggs typically sell for a 10% loss or more. It's true for many other household items like toilet paper, health and beauty products, some frozen goods. But the whole point of a supermarket is that you don't just go in there and buy two items. You're there for the price and the convenience. So you'll do all your shopping in one place. And if you know that the groceries you always need, like milk and eggs, are cheaper in Walmart than any other store, that'll be where you shop. You're not gonna pick up the eggs and milk, check out, then drive to the next store with the cheapest chicken, then the next store with the best price on beer. No, they hook you in with your regular items and know that they'll turn a profit on the other things in your basket. It's their enormous size that allows them to have so many of these lost leaders. They simply have the revenue to walk these margins, knowing that all they need to do is keep getting people through the doors and enough customers will buy big profit margin items to cover the super savers. The model of the grocery business is what a lot of businesses want. Loyal customers making regular purchases because volume is what makes you the real money, most of the time. Better to have a million customers making you a dollar profit than one customer making you a million because you can't rely on just one customer and it might be hard to find another. But if you can sell a million people, why not two million, three, four, and so on? So when Gillette sells you a razor, they don't need to make any money on the handle, which is expensive to produce. You can have that for free for all they care, but once you have the handle, you're locked into buying Gillette blades for months or years, and the blades are cheap to make. Even with a big TV, which has no real consumables to go with it, it's actually more likely they're making money on the cables and the remote, because if you just spent $600 on a TV, they know you'll think, okay, it's just an extra $50 for some add-ons. Your business might not be able to sell at a loss, you need big financial muscle to play the game, but it's worth looking at exactly where you make the most money and make sure you're doing everything to funnel more business in that direction. This could be lowering your price on a popular product if you know it'll make it easier to upsell the really profitable add-ons, or how about providing additional services that may not bring in additional revenue, but could boost sales of your big ticket item. Want to learn more about business theory and history? 
Okay, so that's one uh, really good explanation of loss leader pricing and, uh, and give you a little bit of an explanation or background on this concept of what we call loss leader pricing. So let's talk about price in general. Price is the amount of money charged for a product or service or the sum of all values that customers exchange for the benefits of having or using that product or service. Now, why do we just say the sum of all values? Because we think about cash and non-cash as a possibility of the way in which somebody pays for something. But the total value on our side transferred uh, versus the amount that they're paying on the other side. So price is really the amount charged for that product or service. And we're going to talk a lot about pricing theory and some of the strategies for pricing products. Let's first, uh, let's give a couple considerations for price setting. So one of the key things that we think about when we often talk about price setting is the concept of what we call the price floor and the price ceiling. So the price floor is, this is the point by which we can no longer make a profit on the product that we are producing and selling. So if we take that product in at $1.90 and we sell it at $1.90, that would be our floor. We, we no longer make anything off that product. We are at zero. So below that, we would start losing money to that product. On the other side of the spectrum, we have what we call this price ceiling. And that's, that, this is where the point where our product becomes so expensive that there's nobody out there that wants to actually purchase our product. So we have to fall somewhere between this floor and the ceiling in order for us to make money on every unit of product. And, 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 and this is what we typically think of in our considerations on pricing. Now, in between that, we all think, we think about other things like where the competition's at, what are some of the external factors that are affecting it. Um, we think about the competitor's pricing strategies, our overall marketing strategies and objective and brand of our product, and some of the nature of the market demand. So if it's a very high demand marketplace right now, maybe we're closer to the ceiling price. When it's a low demand marketplace, maybe we're dropping, have to drop closer to the floor price. So we're thinking about this at, and all these factors when we're considering where we're setting our price for a product. So let's talk about one of the most important strategies. We'll talk about a few of the key strategies of foundational strategies of pricing. One of the first one is what we call value price versus cost-based pricing. So on the value-based pricing, we assess the customer's need and value perception. So we first say how much they need this, what kind of value are they getting out of this product? From that, we set the target price to match the customer's value. So we say this is what the price should be at given the amount of value the customer will get from that product. We determine the costs that are incurred for that product. And then from that, we design a product to deliver the value at the target price. So we're really, think about that process versus, now let's hear the process for, for the cost-based pricing. Uh, as opposed to the value and the cost-based pricing, we design a good product. We determine the product's cost. So we say it's a really good product. This is how much it costs to make. Then we set the base price on the cost. So we know what the cost is, we know what the floor is, and then we set that price and we convince buyers to buy at that price. So this is really not thinking about value per se, just on the benefits by which somebody is getting something and trying to price it maximally above that to be able to optimize the sale of that. So one is value-based, the other is cost-based pricing. Two ways of thinking about the same element of being able to bring a price to market of your product. So let's talk about one of the more popular strategies that's out there now in what we call everyday low pricing. A number of different stores use this strategy of everyday low pricing, where it involves charging a constant everyday low price. Now, this is not what we heard about in our example of Walmart. Remember, Walmart does loss leader pricing. As opposed to this, there are many uh, companies that focus on having a low price all the time. Um, and one of those that often talks, uh, talks about having a constant uh, low price all the time are some of the grocery stores, like HEB, for example, and others, where they actually think about having a constant lower price all the time. Uh, Aldi is one of those that, that looks at this. So Aldi is a great example of this. So you can always value 
So you always feel like you're getting a really good price at Aldi. Many of you might shop there. And, but they're always trying to drop all their prices to a low element so you know that you're getting a good deal. They don't sell anything at a loss, but they sell everything at a good deal. Another one is what we call high-low pricing. This involves charging higher prices on an everyday basis, but running frequent promotions to lower prices to bring to, on temporary items to bring people in. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean loss leader. We're actually at a loss. We could just lower certain prices to be able to bring people in and advertise those lower prices. So, for example, you heard in the video about lowering the price of some of those staple goods like milk, for example. That would be an example of what we call high-low pricing, where we high, high price on things, but we low price on certain other things to draw attention to them so that people will come in to shop with us. Another is what we call value-added pricing. This attaches value-added features and services to differentiate from other companies in the marketplace. Uh, we've actually talked about this qu quite a bit in our value services. Remember, a lot of goods out there, we've talked about this, many of the goods in the marketplace are being commoditized. And commoditized meaning they're not seeing a difference between us and the competition. So what do we do to try to add value? We add on services on top of that. So it could, could be those value, remember we talked about value augmentation. It could be like through warranties. It could be through customer support. It could be through all the other things that go around this product to be able to make the services that make it more valuable. So this is what we call value added pricing where we wrap things around it to be able to bring value that allows us to charge a premium on that pricing. This is a very typical one, which is what we call competition-based pricing. This is setting our prices based on the competitor strategies, costs, prices, and market offerings. This is a great case, Pharmacia, they talk about it in our book. But what, what we talk about here is that, that what they're doing is they're constantly out shopping for what are all the prices in the marketplace to be able to bring you to the store that might have the lowest price for medication. And they index their prices based on where those prices are in the marketplace to try to be able to come up with a, a price, an overall best price for their products. So they are always constantly shopping and monitoring. Gas stations will often do this and index where their price is versus everybody else, but constantly monitoring other buddy, everybody else's pricing to be able to set a, a price. Very competitive markets like the airline industry is constantly using competition-based pricing. Constantly aware of what other routes look like, what the prices of those other routes are. So I wanna give you one example that's a little bit different than this, and this actually gets at what we often call the ethical issues uh, in, uh, in, in the pricing uh, spectrum. And I want you to think about this, and I'm, maybe some of you could research this a little bit more and learn about this, but one of the things is what we call the Orphan Drug Act, okay? So uh, one of the things that we know, and this is an interesting thing about price theory and pricing, this is radically different than what we often think about. So for years, rare diseases affecting fewer than 200,000 patients were, uh, were unattractive markets for pharma companies. Why is that? Because pharmaceutical companies, when you have a small number of patients and you can only make so much money off them, it's not valuable to you. So why would we invest in developing drugs that only service a small number of patients? Because we can only charge so much for those drugs. So if we, if we don't... Uh, charge a lot for them, then it doesn't make us enough money just to pay back our, our huge research and development costs. So what the government did is they, ch they changed in 1983 when Congress created what we call the orphan drug designation. This is where the Food and Drug Administration now offers incentives such as fast approval, tax incentives, and longer patient protections for companies developing for rare diseases. So if you have a rare disease for less than 200, that, that affects less than 200,000 patients total, that would be classified as rare disease, you're given an opportunity to get some advantages in the way in which you develop that medication. Faster approval, tax incentives, longer patent protection so you can make your money back. So as a result of this and these incentives, now more than 200 orphan drugs per year entered the market and about one-third gained the Food and Drug Administration's approval to be able to launch these drugs. 
but but these are expensive to users. So these weren't drugs that were ever out there before. So many people didn't have a drug to treat certain diseases or rare diseases. But all of a sudden, certain drugs came out. So for example, Isis Pharmaceutical had a cholesterol drug for a rare condition that would cost you between, this should say, $235,000 and $295,000 per year. That's, that's an enormous amount of money for an insurance company or individual to pay for a drug, but they were allowed to charge that because it's a very rare refractory case of a person who is not responding to cholesterol drugs, and this special drug is out there to be able to take care of it. NPS Pharmaceutical has a drug for a rare bowel condition, it's called Gatex, that costs more than 295000 per year. So in Europe, Sanofi's enzyme replacement therapy drug, Myozyme, uh, cost $900,000 per year. So these high prices fetch more than a billion in, avenue, in, in annual sales, or a third of the orphan drug makers of that category had more than $50 billion in worldwide sales and grow more to than 20% per year in that total category. So they're developing a lot of medication for that small number of patients. So according to the U.S. National Institutes for Health, there are now more than 7,000 rare diseases affecting 30 million Americans. But who pays for these expensive drugs? Should it, every American pay for it? Should, should it be subsidized by our, our U.S. tax dollars? Um, right now, private health plans and government foot the bill. So is that right? Or is this, should this be a, like a total shared expense? Should we develop drugs, that, let's say that there's a rare disease that only affects 200 people a year, should we spend millions and billions of dollars to create drugs in that market or put incentives? So this really gets at some of the challenges about pricing, particularly in markets that affect things that are very critical to people, like pharmaceuticals that affect people's health. So the question would be is, is there a threshold where we no longer invest uh, where, where we don't create medications. At what point does a cost become too much or should the government subsidize those costs? So I'd like you to consider some of these things. We'll talk about this in more detail next class, but it really gets at some of the challenges around pricing and ethics in particular with regard to pricing. All right, well, it was uh, a nice session and uh, I look forward to talking to you next session where we continue some of the information on price as well.